Futurecast. This week on the Deep Leadership Podcast. Really, what is the purpose? What are you are you making this product just to make money? Are you doing it so that you can care for all of these people on your team and you can make the world a better place? I think leaders need to be deliberate and, and have intention around, you know, why am I doing this? What is the point of this company? Hi, and welcome to Deep Leadership. I'm your host, John Rennie. Well, I hope all is well with you today. It is another beautiful day here in North Carolina, and I'm enjoying a hot cup of coffee from our friends at the Salty Sailor Coffee Company. Salty Sailor is a veteran-owned coffee company and is the official coffee of the Deep Leadership Podcast. Listeners get 10% off their amazing selection of fresh roasted coffee by going to SaltySailorCoffee.com and entering the code DEEP at checkout. Well, today's episode is also brought to you by our other sponsors, Leader Connect, Ignite Management Services, and Liberty Strength. All these sponsors help me bring these shows to you each and every week, so I highly encourage you to click on their links below and check them out. Now, in this episode of the Deep Leadership Podcast, I'm joined by Sarah Shear, the founder and executive director of Compassion It, a nonprofit organization focusing on inspiring compassionate actions and attitudes. Now, we sat down and discussed the importance of compassion in leadership, the difference between empathy and compassion, and how compassion can positively impact workplaces and organizations. Now, where does compassion fit into organizational leadership? Well, listen in and find out. So, are you ready to dive in? Let's get started. Welcome to Deep Leadership. Leadership is a people business. That's the philosophy of your podcast host, John Rennie. As a former Cold War submarine officer who spent 20 plus years leading businesses in corporate America before starting his own manufacturing business, he knows that leadership matters. Leadership matters. Are you ready for some real world actionable advice from John as well as his expert guests? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. The show starts right now. Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Sarah Shar. Sarah is the founder and executive director of Compassion It, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to inspire daily compassionate actions and attitudes. She is a Stanford certified instructor of compassion cultivation training and has taught at UCSD Center for Mindfulness, Kaiser Permanente, the Naval Medical Center, and in Africa. She is actively working with businesses to develop more compassionate workplaces, and she is the author of a brand new book called A Case for Compassion, What Happens When We Prioritize People and the Planet. I'm excited to have her on the show to talk about the importance of compassion and why we should lead with it on a daily basis. So, Sarah, welcome to the show. Hi, John. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's an honor to meet you. And I really like this idea of compassion. It's something we haven't talked about in over 300 uh, episodes. So you are the compassionate expert. So I'm excited to have you on board and uh, to learn from you and, and your experience and what you teach on the subject. So, but let's, let's get dive right into the idea. So what is compassion? Compassion at its Latin roots, compassion means to suffer with. So we are willing to be present in the midst of suffering. So a more like dictionary Definition is the willingness and desire to alleviate suffering. So we notice somebody who's struggling and we have the willingness to do something about it. It's it, it's such an important subject. And uh, we've talked a lot about empathy on the show and the importance of empathy and leadership. Um, tell us, like, wh- why is compassion especially so important right now in our time in history? We just came off a, a pandemic uh, you know, the whole world was, you know, shaken apart. Um, work is changing rapidly with AI and the remote work and you name it. So why is compassion so important right now? Well, you brought up a couple important points. And one is empathy. Empathy is a big part of compassion. Empathy is connecting to someone else's feelings. So that is a part of compassion. But with compassion, there's then this willingness to take action to do something about it. Okay, so there's a difference between the two. And compassion means that you're seeing your people as humans. Mm. And you you care for them. 
And leaders need to do that. We need to care for each other and for the people on our teams. Yeah, you, Especially you, now. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, you said something that's really important. I think what you said is compassion is, 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 is not just empathy, but it's empathy in action. In other words, mm-hmm. you sense something's wrong, but you take action to do something about it. And again, going back to that definition of compassion, which was suffering with or at least trying to alleviate, right? So... So you're saying that leaders have to have compassion. They have to have not only empathy, but the willingness to take the next steps. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So what does that look like in practice? Hmm. <laughs> well, it depends. I think, uh, again, noticing the, that the people that you work with are human beings, which is harder to do now that we're on Zoom so much, right? We see, We maybe don't see people physically as often as we used to. But when you can recognize that they're humans and they're worried about something, they struggle with something. So giving people the benefit of the doubt. Uh, But I think what many leaders think, well, compassion will make me soft. Mm -hmm. How can I hold people accountable if I'm this compassionate leader? And you can still hold people accountable and treat them like human beings with kindness and encouragement as like a coach. Yeah, I definitely see that. And I, and I do see the rewards that you get in a workplace that has that level, uh, that were that sort of, uh, you know, I would say emotional intelligence, but also just just the ability to recognize where employees have an issue and you're, you're, you're at least open and you're listening and you're not ignoring. Because I think, you know, I worked 22 years in corporate and I saw a lot of like, just ignore, ignore the emotions, focus on getting the job done. <laughs> uh-huh. And, and you, they were these, you know, and some of these workplaces were not fun to work at and they were, uh, the apathy, uh, was, was high. The, there was no motivation. Uh, everybody was just looking for Friday afternoon to go out and get away from work and there was no energy. And so I think that, um, you know, again, you said that you want leaders to see, they're people as people. And I think that's a big part of it. And in my first book, I say leadership is a people business. So the idea mm-hmm. that we treat people like people, it fits well with what I, I talk about as well. So it's about the idea of people. So, um, you know, we talked about, um, uh, you know, why this is an important time in our history, but uh, maybe give us a little bit more reasons why m- now more than ever, because I, I think I see things like loneliness, depression. Mm-hmm. Uh, I see a lot of things that are that are big these days, which didn't exist prior to social media. And I wonder, you know, I mean, I think that plays a role in some some of this, but um, why is this more important than ever that we, we, we be compassionate as leaders? Well, if you see recent reports about the state of our workplaces, most employees are disengaged. Mm. And we know that Gen Z is not going to put up with that. Yeah. They're not going to stick around and be loyal to you because you're giving them a paycheck. They're going to leave if they don't feel that you're treating them well. So if you want to, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> if you want high employee retention rates, then you need to treat these, especially the younger generation, like human beings with respect and dignity. And, and they care about that. They want to be engaged in the workplace or they're going to leave. And it's harder, as I said, with we're working on Zoom so much. Um, we have a very tricky political climate, to say the least. There is the loneliness, as you mentioned, loneliness, depression, anxiety rates keep increasing. And it's hard. This is a hard world to be living in right now, especially mm-hmm. if you're paying attention to headlines. People are struggling. And if you don't recognize that as a leader... Um, the the folks on your team are not going to want to work for you for very long. Yeah, I definitely see that, and I think the the onus is on the um, the employers these days because there is no um, yeah you know, the, the people can you know there's no uh, problem with switching jobs now. It used to be that you would want to you know stay with the job longer, and now that's not a big deal anymore. People leave jobs all mm-hmm. the time. So, you know, and so there's a lot of opportunity for people to work remotely um, so they can switch jobs with ever, with ever move, without moving. And so I think the onus is on, on leaders if they want to maintain talent, um, uh, then they're going to have to be able to create a workplace where people want to go to work. And like you said, you know, 70% of the workforce is disengaged. So, you know, you're having turnover in your company right now 
because of the way you treat people. And, and, and it's mm-hmm. everybody listening to this call and it may, it's even me. And so mm-hmm. why are people leaving your company? And, and, and it, it's probably because they think they can get a treated better somewhere else. And, uh, and so that's a big part of what, what we do business today. So I love that you bring that up. I love that that's, this is a, an important part of what you do. Um, take us back and uh, tell us how uh, Compassion It got started in the beginning, because I think that's an interesting story. Mm-hmm. Thank you for asking, John. Many years ago, I was going through the most difficult time of my life. I was going through an unwanted divorce. My daughter was just a, a year old. And I had quit my job in the corporate world to be home with her. And um, it it was 2008. I don't know if you remember that time, but there were no jobs. I was looking for a job. There were no jobs. Spent a lot of time on the couch watching daytime television. And I caught an Ellen episode that changed the trajectory of my life. She was interviewing Wayne Dyer. And he's an author and speaker who's passed away. But he was talking about compassion. And he said, compassion is the most important lesson to teach our children. Yeah, they should know math and they should know how to read. But if we taught them compassion, we would solve the social problems on the planet. Mm. There would be no more war, no more hunger. You name the issue, it's gone with compassion. And I had never really thought about how powerful compassion was until I heard him say that. And that very evening, the word compassionate in my mind turned into two words, compassion it. And I thought, oh, that's so cool. It's like, just do it or Google it. That makes compassion a verb. And I immediately saw it as a bumper sticker thinking this could be like the next coexist. And uh, I sat on that idea. I went after the the, uh, trademark and sat on it for a few years. Uh, until it took me a a few years to get my life back on track. And in the meantime, I compassioned it in my life. And I realized, wow, when I lead with compassion in my daily life, things go a lot more smoothly, whether it's dealing with a tricky client or a grumpy boss or my ex-husband. When I remembered compassion, things went a lot more smoothly. So I realized the power of this phrase <clears throat> and I decided I needed to get it out there. So I handed out stickers. I started making t-shirts and then these wristbands that you flip every time you do a compassionate act. One side is black and one side is white. And um, that turned into this global movement. Someone sent one to a YouTuber who had hundreds of thousands of teenage followers. And oh, wow. so literally overnight in 2012, Compassion It became a global movement of compassion. Um, and in the meantime, I got obsessed with compassion and found out that Stanford had the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education, and they were looking for people to, to teach a course they had developed, an eight-week course on compassion. And I was in the very first cohort to go through a year-long program at Stanford back in 2012 to learn how to be, how to teach compassion for self and others. And so... That's how it all started. And here we are 12 years later, and I'm still here doing this work. I love it. So we can credit Ellen for uh, this whole... We can. (laughs) We sure can. It's really interesting. That's one of the things I like about podcasting is that, you know, we have these discussions and there's so many people listen to it. And some one word or one phrase or one guest or one idea can spark a movement. And, and, And in this case, you know, one interview sparked a movement. And I love hearing stories of that. It's that ripple in the water that just continues to go forth. And, you know, that's why we do these podcasts. And that's why we meet people like you, because we just don't know where that ripple's going to go. And and that's and that's exciting to hear that, you know, mm-hmm. one one show on TV changed the trajectory of your life and and other many people's lives because of it. So that, that's a really interesting story. And I love that. That's why I wanted to touch on it real quick. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And so leaders, if you're listening in, you can be that ripple. You can be that stone that hits mm-hmm. the water and you can change people's lives uh, uh, significantly in a positive way. So, and that's what we're trying to do on this show. That's what we're trying to do in our leadership journey. So, mm-hmm. so what, so let's talk about it. So um, we say that leaders should lead with compassion. You say compassion is empathy plus action, right? 
So mm-hmm. what happens if we do this? What happens if we as leaders say, you know what, starting tomorrow, I'm going to lead with compassion, right? What's What happens to our organization when we start doing that? Uh, the, the book that I published looks at compassionate systems and it finds that workplaces, um, educational institutions, healthcare institutions, these places that prioritize compassion have much better outcomes. People are happier at work. Uh, they're connected to each other and to the work more. Um, the company is still successful. The organization still thrives and succeeds. And so I think some people think compassion comes at the expense of achievement or success. And that's not the case at all. Everyone feels better at a place that prioritizes compassion. Um, I mean, it's really hard to to argue against it. The, The book I wrote is called A Case for Compassion, What Happens When We Prioritize People on the Planet. And it's not a hard case to make. Yeah. When you look at these organizations that said, you know what, we're going to care about people on the planet um, more than anything else, you know, that's our priority. They thrive. They thrive. And yeah. it's it makes sense to me. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. As a leader, you're responsible for the mission and the people assigned to you. Regardless of the size of your team, employees are depending on you for their lives and careers. For the sake of your team and the people who entrust you with this role, you need to master the skills to become a great leader. Best-selling leadership author John Rennie is proud to introduce the Qualified Leadership Book Series. This new series teaches you how to become a people-centered leader. Great leaders know that employees who are respected, appreciated, and allowed to grow will go the extra mile. These books provide real-world leadership wisdom written from a hands-on perspective. If you want to be a more effective leader, this is the one book series you should read this year. This three-book series contains the following best-selling leadership books. I Have the Watch, You Have the Watch, and All in the Same Boat for one low price of $39.99. Begin your journey to become a leader worth following. Go to johnsrenny.com and get your order in today. This episode is brought to you by Leader Connect, a leadership training company and video platform founded by the leadership book author and deep leadership podcast guest, Neil Jurd. Leader Connect is a video and podcast streaming platform for leaders and teams. Watch it alone or as a team, and each video supports you and your team, allowing you to improve performance and build a great culture. Join hundreds of experts and learn about leadership, planning, public speaking, team building, mindfulness, and a range of other subjects that will help you lead well and build a great team. I'm proud to say that I'm one of the experts on this platform. Leader Connect is offering a 10% discount to all deep leadership listeners. Go to leader-connect.co.uk and enter the code DEEP at checkout. Master your leadership with Leader Connect. This episode is brought to you by Ignite Management Services. Ignite is led by Mike Watson, who you might remember from episode 137. Mike and his team believe that everything starts with leadership, whether it's strategy execution or cultural transformation, it's the role of the leader to create the conditions for their people to succeed. The team at Ignite can help you develop critical habits to enhance your leadership capability and transform your business. Ignite Management is now offering the Resilient Leadership Assessment Tool. This is an online questionnaire designed to assess and guide leadership development, coaching, and team building. It provides leaders an opportunity to gain insights into their leadership strengths and development needs. After taking this assessment, you will receive a custom detailed report that provides practical and actionable recommendations to enhance your effectiveness. I have taken this assessment myself and found it to be extremely valuable in helping me make changes to my leadership approach. Right now, Ignite is offering 15% off the price of this tool to the deep leadership audience. Go to ignitemanagement.ca and enter the code START15 at checkout to get started today. Yeah, it makes sense for me. I mean, again, I, I, I write about leadership. I talk about it. I've, I've, I've been involved with organizations that do put people first, and I love that. Uh, but it's a hard case for some people because, you know, we, we, that's what I was going to ask you about. So we, we focus on empathy, right, uh, instead of our growth and our profit, right? So we focus on people and the planet instead of growth and profit. Um, 
you know, that's a hard sell for some business leaders. So, because um, we all have stakeholders, I have investors, I have mm-hmm. suppliers, I have customers, right, that I have to take care of. <clears throat> if I'm focused on being compassionate to my employees, for example, and not focused on the business, I, you know, I could struggle. But you say, so the question is like, how do we balance compassion and our business performance? Because I think what I find is we have to do both as business leader. It's right. the end in the middle of that. I got to do, I got to take care of my people, but I also have to perform as a, as a business too. Yeah, absolutely. There's no reason why you can't do both at the same time. Being, I, I love, I think this is a Brene Brown quote, clear is kind. So having clear goals and expectations for your teams and employees and saying, this is where we need to be. This is where we're going but still treating them kindly in a human way. Saying if, if something is happening to get in the way of achieving that goal, what's going on here? Mm. Why, why aren't we performing? You know, le- asking, you know, having curiosity around that. And again, treating them as humans. You know, and I don't know if you um, are familiar with Jeff Weiner, who I don't know if he's still the CEO at LinkedIn, but he was. And he, I saw a whole clip of him being interviewed by Oprah where he was talking about that firing people is, can sometimes be compassionate and often is. If someone isn't in the right role and they're not performing, that's no good for them either. So even letting people go sometimes is, the, is a compassionate act because hopefully you're doing it in a kind way and you're helping them find a role that, that suits them better. But you don't just... Um, yeah, you, you don't let go of your, your goals and your need to achieve to be a compassionate leader. In fact, if you're not financially successful, you can't pay people. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah so <laughs> nobody's around, nobody's going to have a job if you're not meeting your goals. Now, I do think that there is a difference between meeting financial goals that are attainable and they're good enough, and as opposed to, you know, all of our investors need to make so much money that we're being greedy, we're get, we don't care about our employees and their well-being. It's all about the money. That's different, right? But I think if you're not financially sustainable, if you're not a good steward for your organization, um, nobody's going to have a job, frankly. So that is yeah. passion. Yeah, I love it. As, you know, as a, as, a, as a business owner myself, I can get on board with this because I can see how it benefits my business I, I can see how it helps my employees be more focused, you know, get get the job done. And, and I know it will, it's going to impact my bottom line. And I think about like maybe listeners who are, are listening in that and maybe in a big corporation where, um, you know, there's a big corporation and there's certainly not compassion on the on the list of prior, you know, priorities for the company. But can you create compassion in your own little world and your own, you know, in your own sphere of influence? And and sure. is that contagious, I wonder? Uh, compassion is contagious. We know that there's research that indicates that. So yes, it is contagious. If you see someone being compassionate, you are more inclined to then be compassionate. It's really cool how that happens. Um, but yes, it, within your team, you can you can be the leader that starts your meetings with a, a check-in. How's everybody feeling on a scale of one to 10? All right, let's let's check in as humans before we dive into our agenda. Because mm-hmm. what if everybody's at a one? One is, you know, the worst ever and 10 is the best ever and everybody's at a one or two. Something's going on. Maybe this isn't the time to dive into your agenda. Mm-hmm. Let's address what's happening. Maybe there was a tragedy that happened in the community or or something's going on in the world where people are really feeling low. Then as a leader, you want to tease that out and find out, okay, what's going on? How can I, how can I help people feel better and connected? And then we can move on to our agenda later. But I think that's one very easy step to take as a leader is starting your team meetings with a check-in. How are we feeling right now? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I know in my company, we do a stand-up meeting every morning and it's my chance to look everybody in the eye. And it is, that's exactly what it is, is like, uh, how are people doing today? And I can sort of uh-huh. sense, you know, who's who's not, you know, not well. There, it's funny because I get to know my employees so well. I know who's not a morning person. So if I see them not looking <laughs> so great, I'm like, okay, that's that's normal for that person. 
But that person is normally chipper in the morning and she's not. Something's wrong. Yeah. And so it gives me a chance to see. One of the things I was thinking as you were talking through this, this idea of empathy and action, I, I have met so many leaders, I've, I'll call them managers, not leaders, with zero empathy. Like they, they literally don't have that button. It's not in their toolbox. And do you have any suggestions for, um, for those that might be listening in that either have that same problem or they know somebody that has a problem, they have just have very little empathy for others. Is there a way to even develop it or fix it Mm -hmm. or start, start, you know, softening yourself to the idea of the, you know, the concerns of others. Cause I really saw that in my corporate days, there was just zero empathy. Like, you know, like, Oh, I've got a, I've got a doctor's appointment. It's like, well, you should have thought of that before, before, you know, you came to work here. You're like, okay. Right. (laughs) Right? So I'm just wondering if there's, if there's a way to develop empathy, if you don't have it in, in compassion. There absolutely is. The problem is you want, you need somebody who, who has, who wants to, Yeah. right? I can't tell you, you need to develop empathy if that person doesn't have that desire. Uh, And oftentimes it needs to start with our own selves. So if they're not seeing the humanity of of their own selves and pausing and saying, wow, what am I worried about? What am I struggling with? Where do I need support? They don't do that for themselves. Then it's really hard to recognize that other people need that too. Yeah. So self-compassion is actually a very big part of compassion. Setting boundaries and saying, hey, I can't work past this time because I have this thing to do or whatever it is. I can't work this weekend because I'm going to my kid's game. Mm. Um, as a leader, setting boundaries and recognizing your own um, humanity, that can help you see others in the same way. Yeah, I I, li- I like that. I like that. I was wondering too, as I was thinking about what you were talking about too, is there a generational issue here in that? Because I'm a Gen X, right? In Gen X, we were, you know, we were free range kids, right? We were, we, <laughs> we just sort of did our, we just, nobody cared about us. We, we, we grew up outdoors. And, um, and so we, yeah. we, and we, and we were taught to work for one company you know, and they're going to treat you like crap and you're going to do whatever it takes because you, you, you want, you, you want us to keep this job and get the gold watch at retirement. And now you have Gen Z who's switching jobs every two years. And they say, if you don't treat me well, I'm going to leave. I, I think there's a gap there. I think, I think mm-hmm. some, I, I don't know what you're thinking or what you've seen throughout your training, but I think there possibly could be a generational gap. Like I think we're Absolutely. working, right. You know, because I'm a Gen X, you know, leader, <laughs> And I've got Gen Z employees yeah. are saying, I need a mental health break. And you're like, mm-hmm. I never got a mental health break throughout my 30 years. So do you think there's a generational issue there? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You hit the nail on the head there. And yeah. so we, as I'm also a Gen Xer, and we just have to recognize, I think there's a lot of wisdom in this younger generation. Yeah. Yeah. Right. How wonderful to say, you know what? I work most of my life. Almost every day is spent at work. I want to do something that fuels me and doesn't deplete me. I don't care so much about making all this money because I know that money doesn't give me fulfillment and true and connection. And that's what we know matters. Um, so I think, you know, Gen Xers need to pause and and take a minute and recognize what you know, this is a new generation and they have some wisdom here. Uh, exactly. You know, I would say this for my Gen Xers who are listening out there is like, you got to thank a Gen Z because they're actually talking about themselves and taking care of themselves. We never did. <laughs> we just, we just we said, didn't. burn, do whatever, do whatever it takes to, uh, to, to, to take care of your family, to earn money. And even if you get, you know, treated like crap, you just kept, you keep persevering. So, you know, hey, Thank the Gen Zs for saying, "Hey, you know what? That's probably not the right way to live." And so they brought it up. Have, yeah, yeah, and they've seen us do that, and they don't want that. Yeah, in their yeah. lives, right? Yeah. They're saying, "I saw what Dad did. I saw what Mom did. That's not the kind of life I want." Yeah. So I'm. I think we need to appreciate them. I again, we can still hold them accountable. Right. Right. But we can do it in a human way. Yeah, I love that. I love that. So I think that just there's some generational things there, and so. <laughs> Make sure that you don't apply your standards of what you did in your life to these to the new employees and younger employees because they're they're seeing life differently. So, and that's part of compassion is having that 
ability to see it from their perspective, for sure. Yep, a big part of it. So in the book, you've got lots of stories um, and examples of compassionate uh, people, leaders, uh, professionals. Can you give us maybe an example of you know, a story or two from the book of like people with compassion and how that's helped them or how has it helped help the world as well? Yeah, so the book focuses a lot more on compassionate systems. Mm. So it's looking at, my argument is because I've been teaching compassion to thousands and thousands of people over the years, right? I've taught compassion so many people. A lot of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people have these wristbands and I'm not seeing the compassion needle moving. Mm. And so I I realized, you know what? We got to look at our systems because we are products of our systems. And if we can change the systems, that's how we can create a more compassionate world. So I'm, I wanted to examine some systems that are doing compassion well uh, in the world. So, um, so the book isn't looking as much at specific leaders. There is a chapter on leadership. I guess I will take that back. But um, when we look at compassionate systems, I think it's interesting to see like the, the um, there's a, a co-op in, Mond- in uh, the Basque region of Spain called Mondragon. And they have over, I think over, oh man, now tens of thousands of employees, huge, huge corporation. And they make sure that the, their lowest paid employee the CEO of the company, I think, can't make more than six times what the lowest paid employee makes. Now, if you look at our S&P 500, the average um, CEO, what they make compared to their average employee, it's 299 times. Mm-hmm. Okay, so these are organizations that say, hey, we're maybe going to sacrifice the salaries of our leaders and people up top because we want everyone to have a living wage. Everybody there gets three weeks of vacation. Everyone can send their kids to college, no problem. Everybody can own a home. And it's this idea that we are taking care of each other in this way. And we're structuring this company in a way that everyone is an owner and everyone feels supported. And there's not this this person at the top that makes so much more than everyone else. Um, and it's it's the company drives. So I think that is just a neat example of a way that, and I don't know if it can happen in the U.S. Right? Our our organizations are look a lot differently. Yeah, it's it's India. interesting because you, you you point that out. That's not the first thing I was thinking is like just the opposite of a lot of uh, American companies, U.S. companies. Uh, you know, as a small business owner, I sort of sort of fit more like that model. I, like my, mm-hmm. it's a small team. You know, we're, we're more like a family than we are. You know, a corporation. I I don't know what my multiplier is for the lowest paid employee, but it's not that much. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. You know? but uh, but and yeah. and I do it because I love it, and uh, and I love yeah. what I do. But I I think that. Um, I would say this, you know, leaders that want to pursue, you know, a, a, a compassionate system like that is that you have to find, it's it's hard work, which means that you have to find a way that you can be in the world with your products or services that you're exceptional because you have to be exceptional to be able to make the kind of, you know, returns to be able to support the employees like that. So I think it, the pressure is on for mm-hmm. leaders to make themselves a, an, a, an especially good organization from a standpoint of, of uh, profitability, customer loyalty, all those things are really important if you want to create an environment like that. So it's not that you can just be compassionate and and say, okay, we're just going to be compassionate and then go out of business in a year. No, right. it's the opposite. So the, that company that you're talking about in Spain is very successful at what they do. I don't know who they are, but they're very successful mm-hmm. so that they can do these things. And I think yes. it's, they're, 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 they're one and the same is what I, what I sense. Yeah, same with Patagonia. I talk about Patagonia in the book as well, right? Everybody loves that brand. They care about the planet and their employees. They had uh, childcare in their office decades before other people were thinking about that. So they have always prioritized their employees and the planet. And it shows there it's a highly, highly successful company. And they're giving a lot of money to nonprofit organizations that are um, helping our environment get healthier. 
So yeah. Um, it's, it's really neat to see. And there, there, there was a not, there's a nonprofit. I think it's a nonprofit. Maybe it's not a bakery in New York that they provide the brownies for, I, I don't remember. Maybe it's Southwest Airlines. I don't remember what airlines, but they have, have huge accounts. They make a ton of, they bring in a lot of revenue. And it was a Buddhist monk that started this bakery mm-hmm. just to be able to hire people. So they say we bake brownies in order to help people, we don't, we don't, in order to hire people, we don't hire people to bake brownies. Interesting. Yeah. So the whole idea, and they bring it, you know, they are a really unique company that hires formerly incarcerated people or folks who really wouldn't normally get a, a chance to have a good job like this. And they pay them well and help them um, thrive. So it's a neat, it's another really neat organization to look at. And consider what really what is the purpose? What are you are you making this product just to make money? Are you doing it so that you can care for all of these people on your team and you can make the world a better place? I think leaders need to be deliberate and and have intention around, you know, why am I doing this? What is the point of this company? I love that. Yeah, that's a great message. So let's let's wrap it up. What final message would you like to leave my listeners on the subject of compassion? Gosh, the final, this feels like a lot of pressure, John. Of course. But I did. <laughs> everyone, so you're, I'm not singling you out. <laughs> I do think it's as simple as seeing all humans as humans. Taking the time to do that. I love it. That's it's such a simple and powerful message. And again, if you've read my books, you know I say leadership is a people business. Listeners, leadership is about people and, and understanding people means having empathy and compassion uh, towards your employees and seeing them as people, not as headcount. I hate that expression. How many How many headcount do we have? It's like, no, we have this many people, <laughs> not headcount. And uh, so I love that. So so start thinking uh-huh. of your people as people, start treating them as people, start having that uh, ability to see them more than just uh, how many uh, widgets they're going to make in a day. And I think you're going to do a lot better as a leader and your company's going to do a lot better. And we can help move this needle of compassion that hasn't been moving very much. And, uh, and so uh, how can our listeners find out more about you, Sarah, and uh, your company and this new book? Yeah, thank you. My organization is Compassionate. So it's the word compassion, the word it, and then .com is the website. So compassionate.com. You can find me on LinkedIn as well. We also have all the social channels. So at Compassion It. And my book is called A Case for Compassion. What happens when you prioritize people and the planet? You can buy that on our website. Also, everywhere else you would buy books online. So... Fantastic. We got, we're going to put links in the show notes for all of Sarah's resources. And again, listeners, please, uh, I, I hope that you walk away with this and say, you know what, there is a case for compassion. Uh, we need to be thinking about being more compassionate as leaders. And uh, it can be good for both our people and our business. We can be successful and compassionate at the same time. So so hopefully that you will follow the links below. If, if you have a question about this uh, conversation, I would highly encourage you to reach out to Sarah uh, through the website and just ask her questions. Say, I saw you on Deep Leadership and I'm wondering about X, Y, and Z. And she's happy to answer your questions. Pick up this book. uh, And especially if you're struggling with understanding what compassion is, or maybe you have an empathy button that doesn't work. And uh, you might want to read through it and see what other people are doing, other leaders are doing, and how successful their operations are because of it. So I encourage you to think about compassion this week uh, and uh, and really follow up with Sarah, get this book and learn more about it. So Sarah, thanks for coming on the show and sharing this subject, which we haven't covered yet before. And I learned a lot about it and uh, I appreciate your time and the energy you're putting into this important subject. Thank you, John. It was really fun. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well.
Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all you do. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information and updates, please visit our website at www.deepleadershippodcast.com or johnsrenny.com. Until next time, take care. Hey there, fabulous souls. I'm Stephanie Baklaan. And I'm Eden Alpert. And we're the hosts of the brand new podcast, Unapologetically Fab. Get ready to join us on an amazing and real journey as we dive into life after 40 and own it. We're all about changing the narrative, leaning into who you are, and living a life by your own design. Join us as we embrace life unapologetically and redefine success. This is Unapologetically Fab. An electric cast production. See you there. Electric cast. Today is working for me. Do you believe that for yourself? Hey, I'm Pastor Julie, and I want to empower you through encouragement, inviting you to my podcast, Big Truth Encouragement, where I unpack living a faith-filled life. I created my podcast for the ladies, but gentlemen, you'll gain something too. So I invite you to listen to Big Truth Encouragement on ElectroCast and any platform where you listen to your podcast. ElectroCast.